Okay, so that's just the way it goes. All right. Let's look at the first game against Romanovsky. Romanovsky was a good player of this time. I'm not sure if we'll talk about him in a lecture, but he's got a few gems as well. All right. So e4, c6, the Carol Khan defense. d4, d5, knight to c3. So these days, I mean, in this position, most players advance. But for many, 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 many years, knight c3 or knight to d2 developing and guarding the pawn similar to the french defense were considered the was considered the best way to play against the carol Khan because you're bringing out pieces and you still haven't allowed black an easy way to get their bishop into the game okay black captures as to not allow white to completely take over the center knight takes and now Knight to d7, sometimes known as the Smyslov variation, sometimes known as the Karpov variation. So, okay, well, knight to d7, here's the basic point. The basic point is we want to challenge this knight in the center, but in the event of a capture, we want this knight to be able to capture back. We do not want to have to capture with our pawn. These days, people do play this move and allow the crippling of their pawn structure one way or another, but it's not to everyone's taste. So knight to d7, knight f3. I faced this many times in my life. I always played bishop to d3 here. Um, but knight f3 and this possible variation is a pretty, a solid one for, for white. So bishop to c4, I like that move. Now tell me this, chat, tell me this. So... In this particular situation, black wants to get the light squared bishop out. However, this doesn't really get it out. This allows a terrible pawn structure damage. This is one possible way, and this is another. What is wrong with this move? Can somebody tell me? What is wrong with the move bishop to g4, which looks like such an innocent move a beautiful developing move, pinning the knight on f3 and causing hardship. Mm -hmm. Very good. Bishop takes f7 check. You lure the king out and then you play knight e5 check with the fork and a discovery on the bishop on g4. So even though this line for white seems pretty tame, it's not that easy for black to complete development. Black should play bishop to f5. In the game, Romanovsky played g6. And g6 is designed to later get this bishop out, but first develop the king side. I like here what Ilyan Zanevsky played. He played the move knight to g5, immediately putting the pressure on immediately putting the pressure on the black position, going after the f-pawn and saying, well, if I get you to play the move e6, right, blocking my attack, then the, the moves e6 and g6 in conjunction with each other weaken the dark squares, but also blocks in this bishop. So Romanovsky was like, well, I would like to not have to play the move e6, so I'll play knight to d5. But you can see, like, you can see how white's pieces are starting to dance against the f-pawn. This knight has moved a few times. So white brings another piece into the attack and tries to swiftly attack while the black king is in the center and black doesn't have much development. So white plays queen f3 with a direct attack on f7. Well, how do you deal with this, right? You can't play knight back. Because then you allow bishop takes f7. Your knight's not blocking anymore. So the only real thing that you can do here is something like f6. It's too late to try to play the move bishop to f5. Because after the move g4, I'm going to smack that bishop right out, of the, right out of the f file. So, okay. So in the game, f6 was played. And... Well, there's a lot of pressure on Black's position 
Bauer Salat, thank you so much for um, for a subscription. Welcome, Nick. Welcome, Kali. Welcome, Dinekis. Welcome, everyone. So, F6 is a very weakening move. And even though it gains a tempo on the knight and, and forces the knight to, you know, forces white to react to this, it weakens black's position heavily because here's the thing. When you play F6, this diagonal is open forever. Right? This diagonal is open forever. And after the move knight to e4, you know, there are some basic threats coming. I mean, he moves the knight away. Now, here is where, where fundamentally Romanovsky plays a bad move or a bad sequence of moves. And I would say the older the games, the more principled, let's say, in a way the players were. Here's what Romanovsky was thinking. He's like, wait a minute. I can play my knight back to b6. And I can attack your bishop. And I can also threaten your pawn. So if I play the move knight to, knight to b6, I can attack your bishop and have a discovery on your pawn. But I feel like that's sort of a step in the wrong direction. Shouldn't black be going bishop to g7 and castle and get the king out of the middle? Right? If I'm playing black here and I'm like, I just played f6, taking away good squares from my pieces. I've pried open this diagonal. If I move this knight off of d5... This bishop is going to reign free here, right? So I'm thinking to myself, I cannot believe Romanovsky played the move knight to b6, attacking this bishop with intention to take this pawn, right? So Ilyan Zanevsky was like, you go ahead. You really want that, you really want that pawn? Now that you've allowed my bishop to stop you from castling and it's ripping through your position, go ahead and take it. So Romanovsky was like, okay, I don't mind if I do. Thank you so much. I will grab that little sweet thing right there. And I'll say, what do you got? I'll show you some nice, cute little variations here. So bishop to e3 was played. And in the game, queen e5 was played. But I was looking at a possible, another greedy move, right? I was like, what if black took another pawn here? Because in the game, what happened after queen e5 was white castled and got the rook to the d-file and protected the king. So, out of curiosity, I was like, okay, let's have a look at queen takes b2, since that attacks the rook and prevents castling to the queen side. So, rook to d1, and now there's a very sneaky and dirty threat in the position, which is bishop to d4. And you're like, well, that doesn't do anything, right? So I'm going to play bishop to f5. Something like that. Okay. And now, if you move your queen, the only place to move your queen is a3. And then what very nasty move can white play here, which picks up the queen? Use the coordinates. Yeah, exactly. It's not even bishop takes f7 anymore. It's just bishop f7. You just plop you just plop that bishop into f7 for a check, and then you grab the queen over on a3. Right? There's a trick like this in the knight or poison pawn as well. Don't you know that's why your pieces don't belong looming everywhere with no development and a weak king. So that was one variation. Another variation. I thought was, you know, maybe the queen goes away right now before this bishop can move for the discovery. But in, in a position like this, white is just too active for black to justify, you know, for black to justify, you know, what he did in the opening, which was move the queen 800 times to grab two pawns. But look at this. Guns blazing here. Knight takes f7 is being, or knight takes f6 is being threatened. There's all sorts of tricks in this position. Knight d6 is even a threat. It's hard to move. You move this pawn, f6 hangs for free. So that would not have worked out well. Neither did, neither did queen to e5. But okay, white in this case got to castle to the queen side, which guards the, 
which guards the pawn on b2 and activates the pieces. So if we take a look at this position, right, we're like, was it worth the pawn? You always have to ask yourself. And recently I've been playing uh, on stream. I don't know if some of you have caught it, but we, uh, I've been playing some hand and brain with Daniel Naroditsky, which is where like we tell, like I say, Daniel move a bishop and then he has to decide which bishop to move and where to move it. And so it's like a team game. Okay. So, you know, there's difference in thought, but I am not a grabber of pawns, especially if that means that that accelerates my opponent's development. I am not a huge fan of grabbing pawns because I'm like, well, wait a minute. You want me to grab that one little pawn at the expense of the rest of my forces. And what you're saying is that pawn's going to help you win 50 moves from now. Mm, let's think about that. Okay, let's think about that. Maybe if I'm a computer, I grab the pawn and say, what you got? Which this, and again, this is the, this is the danger behind only looking at computer evaluation in chess. You're like, the computer takes it and then you're like, I'm a genius, equal, right? And then every move from the moment you take that pawn to, to the moment you get checkmated, every move is a minefield of tactics against you because your pieces are in total disarray. So I'm not a huge fan of grabbing pawns. In this case, it's even more obvious that black should not have grabbed the pawn because where in the world is black gonna castle? How is black gonna complete development, right? Welcome, welcome, thank you, thank you Grant for the subscription to the channel. We're working our way back up to 200. We're not there yet, we only have 185. Our goal, our ultimate goal in the near future is 300, but we gotta get back to 200. Okay, so knight to d5, the knight comes back again. And the purpose of knight to d5 was to block this diagonal and get the knight back into the game. So what has happened? Black is up a pawn, but black is suffering like crazy because his king is stuck in the center, he has no development, and castling is not in sight. Here, white wins their pawn back with the following, white wins their pawn back with the following chess tactic, the sequence of moves. What did white play here to win their pawn back? Okay, very good everyone. So bishop takes d5, pawn takes d5, and rook takes d5, awesome. So a mini combination of moves there, which wins the pawn back. If the queen takes, then the queens are aligned, so this knight takes f6, check, and discovery against the queen. Yeah, so, you know, like pawn takes knight, and then queen takes queen, right? So. Black is black is sort of dead in the water here, um, in the in this position. So, so rook takes d5. I mean, black is already sort of dead because black is now not up a pawn anymore. The the you know the development of the white pieces has has at least gotten back the pawn and some because here the the poor king is still in the middle. And white has the tempo because white's attacking the queen. Of course, the queen can't take the rook because of the discovery. And so not only is white now equal on material, but white has the development. White has the king's safety. White has the initiative. White's calling the shots, right? So bishop to g4. I thought this was a very good move uh, given the circumstances. And now, what do you think white played here, chat? And once again, thanks to Innovative Panda. If you got a sub from Innovative Panda, at least give him a thank you and a shout out for supporting the channel. And uh, it'll spare you some of the commercials. If you have to watch commercials, you won't have to watch them anymore. So, greatly appreciate it. So, um, what did white play here after the move bishop to g4? So, first of all, let's talk about why bishop to g4 was played. So bishop to g4, the idea is if you take, 
Now I can take this rook because there's no discovered attack on the queen anymore. So that's the idea of jettisoning the bishop here on g4. But Ilyan Zanevsky had a nasty move in store for Mr. Peter Romanovsky. What did he play? I already see some people in the chat with it. So again, if queen takes bishop, queen takes rook. That's the idea, and there's no more discovery on the queen. What did what did Ilyan Zanevsky, the player playing the white pieces, the man of the hour, what did he play here? Knight takes f6 check. So if the pawn takes, now you can take the queen with check. So they don't get your queen. So that's number one. Knight takes f6. Of course, you could take with the queen. Right? But after queen takes, right, then it's queen takes g4, which has happened in the game. Now, let's talk about this a little bit. Let's talk, let's compare the two lines because the only other answer that I saw was rook takes queen first, bishop takes f3, and knight takes f6, which is also looking good. But let's, ha let's evaluate this position, because this knight is hanging and this bishop is hanging, right? Well, number one, white has the better, white has the better game here, because white's forces are, are ready to get into the game. However, would you rather have a pawn-up position like this, where the queens are off the board, or would you rather have a pawn-up position like this one where the queens are on the board. And I think that all that's relative to the position itself, but in this one, if you're playing white, would you rather have queens on or queens off? Yeah, so I'd want the queens on, O-N, on. Okay, if I'm playing white, I want the queens on, okay? And the reason why I want the queens on is because I have a better king than they do. They don't have a king. I have a king. They don't have a king. I have a king. Their king is trash. Okay? And it's worse for them if your queen is on the board because it's more artillery. Right? It's more ways for you to take advantage of their exposed king. So that's the deciding factor when you're trying to decide which pieces to keep on in a position like this. So there's an old, there's an old saying in chess, which I think is, let me, I don't want to offend people and their coaches and the people who have taught them this, but there's an old saying in chess that is, when you're up material trade, which is really a trash saying if you know what that's a saying that needs to have like two page of a two pages of appendices attached to it so that way it, there's a full explanation of that rule because it's not a good rule the trading there's only one rule i can think of in regard it in regard to trading right that would that pretty much fits you know, pretty much fits the, the, the bill every time, which is when you're trading, right? You trade if you're getting attacked, you trade off the attackers, right? But if you're attacking, trading is not usually what you want to do. And being up a material is not the factor in this position right here. You're up one pawn, right? Big whoop right? White is up a one pawn. The biggest thing that of importance here is black's king. Black has no king. No shelter, no development, no king. All of those are better taken advantage of with, with, with white having more pieces on the board, right? So forget about the trade when you're up thing. Like don't, don't have that in your mental algorithm, okay? Just think of it as you know, in chess, everything is, 
everything is different and it's more about trading off important pieces versus less important pieces. Not like just arbitrarily, blindly trading just because you're up a measly little pawn. So I like this way better than this way. Because here, it's not overly clear to me how big the attack is gonna be here for white and how much the initiative and the extra pawn mean here as compared to what happened in the game. This way, where white keeps the queen, white keeps the extra pawn, pawn structure remains intact, and white keeps the attacking possibilities open. So just keep that in mind because these lectures are a little bit entertainment, a little bit, uh, a little bit enlightening, right? They're supposed to be a learning, it's supposed to be a learning thing too. So that is a that is a rule that is is regularly said trade trade when you're down or trade when you're up and I just really don't I really don't allow it. I don't I really don't like the rule and I never really teach it to my to my students I never did Chess is not something you can play based upon rules Everything is different okay Everything is different the most important thing is the king no matter what position, the king is the most important. That's how you end the game. So queen c6. Uh, okay, the queen moves. Pressuring the rook, but only asking for white to get this rook out of the corner and double up. Bishop to g7. And now I like what white did here. So black was thinking, maybe if I'm lucky, Ilyan Zanevsky will let me castle to the king side. You know, like maybe, no. Despite white being up a pawn, white still has to be persistent here and try to prevent black from coordinating, try to, try to prevent black from coordinating his forces. Black would like to play castles, get the rook into the game. Black would remain a pawn down, but black would have better chances than here with his king in the center. So what did white play to distract black from castling? Okay, Patil's got an answer over there. Dinekis has got an answer. JBC has got an answer. All of them are answers. They're all they all stop or or deter black from castling. So very good so far. Queen f3 I C, rook d6 by DJ Punk. Rook c5, rook d7. Okay, queen f3, rook c5, bishop c5. Okay. So several different answers in the chat. That's good. That means people are thinking in different ways. So rook c5 was played. So rook c5 is a monster move. I don't see how you deal with it because the queen wants to come to d7. And the rook on c5 is protected by the bishop. And the rook, of course, is attacking the queen. And I just don't see how you can stop queen to d7, which would in essence, mean you're not castling. And you can castle here if you want. Now, give, give me that queen, though. Right? So, castle if you want, but it's going to cost you big time. So, white didn't do that. What, or black didn't do that. Black played queen a6. By the way, queen b6, queen b6 fails to what move? So, the idea is to counterattack. But remember... You don't get to play tactics when your position blows. So, white with the knockout here. What does white play? That's right. That's exactly right. Rook to c8 check and a discovery on the queen. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. And honestly, it's not even hard because this is even protected, right? So, you don't even have to worry about it. You're not even sacrificing anything. You're just gonna you're just gonna be up a bunch of material, so no counterattack possible. So queen a6, of course the whole point of making the rook move was queen to d7 check. Now you know black's not castling, so black played king f7. And okay, so Juan asks, what about queen f6? But that one has also an easy an easy answer. So. Queen f6 aligning the queen bishop battery 
but you can stifle that with one move. That's all you need is just one move here. And you just put it right in their face. Yep, Dineki's got it. Bishop to d4. You, you gain your tempo back and you skewer them. Yeah. Because you got the skewer going on here. And you still have all of the attacking possibilities. Like, for example, queen f7, that stops the king from escaping. So now you have the move rook to c8 check. And then queen takes checkmate, right? So guarding this bishop is actually going to be uh, quite difficult to do in this position. So, okay, so queen a6 was played by Romanovsky. Queen d7, white played, because the thing about it is you don't want to allow black to castle, and this is a sure way that he's not going to castle. Now, black has connected the rooks, but black's king is quite vulnerable. So what could you do here if you wanted to continue to harass the black king? What could you do? I would say that several moves are acceptable here. So like rook to c7, lining up the attack on the e-pawn makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, queen to d5, check. Trying to induce him to play e6, so that way we can get the rook down to the 7th rank, makes a lot of sense. So queen to d5, check was played. The only, the only move keeping black in the game here is the offering of the queen trade. Because if you go e6 here, then like this is, this is terrible. This is so bad. Yeah. The, the rooks will be disconnected once again. And the rook infiltrates on the 7th rank. And it's all she wrote there. You guys know that story. So, queen d5 check, queen to e6. And rook c7. So basically, in this position, the queen trade has been offered. However, if you take it, we have these roving rooks on the 7th rank. We're already up a pawn. We did not damage our pawn structure. And all of our pieces are going to be in the game. Where There's no rook over here hiding and double pawns. So this is a much better, better version of the, of the possible one before. And now this was the last straw. This was the last straw. Bishop to e5. All right. Let's, let's, let's play our tactical, tactical approach here. White to play and finish the game. So you're playing white. You're, you've, you've played strategic, from a strategic standpoint. You've played a phenomenal game here as white. You, you could barely have played better. I mean, Ilyan Zanevsky could not have played this position much better than what he did. It's 22 moves into the game. You have the knockout blow finally. You know, you're already winning the game, but you have the knockout here. And that's what you need in a chess game, right? You can win a pawn over here and a pawn over there. And you can take over the outpost square. And you can do all these fancy professional things. But at the end of the day, you have to play the knockout, right? And this is the knockout. And if you can't see the knockout, then you don't, you don't, you make life difficult for yourself. You may win after 60 moves. But remember, the longer you and I play moves in a chess game, the more we open the doors to error, right? So if you got the win, then hit them, right? If you have the win in hand, right, then, then take it. So what's the move? I see Dineki says rook takes e7 and Andre Katz says rook takes e7. E7's ma says queen f3. But queen f3, I mean, I don't see how that's a knockout because queen f3, they can block in several different ways. So I'm not sure how that's the knockout. Bishop h6, okay, but not really a knockout per se. That's more of a calm move. Thank you, Anu, for the subscription. That's five months now. So you've been with us since the beginning. Awesome. Queen d7, rook e7. Yes, very good, everyone. Rook captures e7, a brutal, 
brutal, brutal, brutal move. But this is why this here is the precise reason why people tell you to do your chess tactics. Because you've done everything so right. You've done everything so right, right? Like you won a little pawn. You got the guys not castling anymore. You have your pieces in the game. So you've done everything right. But he's still hanging in there because, because you just made the, you did the basics. You didn't do anything beyond the basics. And that's where you need the tactical ability. Like right here, rook takes e7, crushing move. So number one, the queen can't take because it's in a pin. Number two, if you don't take that, you lose your queen. So forget about it. You've got to take it. So it, the line is very narrow. So king takes, king takes queen, or sorry, king takes rook, guarding the queen. Now, bishop to g5 check. Time to analyze again. This check is brutal because if you move the king away, then I just take the queen. So that's easy, right? If you, if you can push the guy's king away from their queen, you win their queen, you win the game. That's certainly a knockout blow. Okay. What about, there are two things that could happen here. King f7, which is what happened in the game, and bishop to f6. Let's do bishop f6 because that wasn't played, and then we'll go back to the, the, the game and see how the game ended. So what happens after bishop to f6? How do you win material here? You get it all back and some. You get it all back and some. Space coach says takes on b7. I see the only, I, that is the only option that I even see to keep the attack going. Queen takes b7. This is brutal because we're attacking this rook and there's no way that for that king to escape. The king's gonna have to go to the back rank and then we're gonna snap that rook off. So let's say here, takes, and then, you know, we, well, maybe not that, cause you know, we have this option, but maybe like king f7, and then we just come straight back and the guy's dead in the water. Now we're up three pawns, not just one, we're up three pawns with the brutal initiative, right? Rook's coming down to the seventh rank. The, the king's getting hit all over the place. Black's pieces are only passive. Attempt to, please, please don't get me, right? Attempting to, cap, attempting to guard the king. So, yeah, this isn't going to work out. So, in the game, king f7 was played. But, okay. Queen takes b7 check. We rounding up that pawn. If the king goes to the back rank, he loses. So, I mean, I don't know if this was actually played or not, but in my PGM, bishop to c7 was played. And then after queen takes c7, resign. Because here, even though by distracting the queen away from the attack on the rook, that means that the king can go to the back rank. It doesn't matter because, look, here's the thing. Look at this. So how might the game finish here? How about this? How about this? We play bishop h6. Okay, we play bishop to h6, and we threaten checkmate in one move. Which seems pretty brutal. Now, they have to cope with a bunch of different things. Rook to the seventh rank, the immediate checkmate in one, rook to the eighth rank. If this queen moves off of this diagonal, queen c4 check or all sorts of, this is just over. There's no way to spin it. All right, so let's say something like this happens. We bring this rook down to the final rank, or to the seventh rank, and now this is being threatened. You're not surviving. You're simply, simply not surviving. So Romanovsky resigned after bishop to c7 
Queen takes c7. He just said, all right, screw this. Like, I'm done. I'm not playing this. I'm not playing this anymore. Now, let's summarize this game. Yep, let's summarize the important points. And I'll just say the following thing, and I, and I say this in all of my, my lesson streams. When you review a game of chess, you're not going to remember it. You're not going to remember the whole game. A month from now, three months from now, 10 months from now, five years from now, 30 years from now, none of that matters. Here's what matters. You saw a game and you remembered an idea. That's the thing. You saw a game and you're like, I remember Giannato showing me that game and this stuck with me on that game. And I don't remember, it was Romanovsky or Ilyan Zanevsky or Miss Brenda or Alan Hancock, whoever, it doesn't matter who it was. What matters is you saw the game, you walked away from that game saying, um, oh, I'm gonna do that on somebody or, or I am gonna, you know, remember to do that or I'm gonna remember not to do that or whatever. Right, so you walk away from a game doing that. Like for example, there are all these famous games where the grandmasters, like the top, the top um, players in the world, they know these games like verbatim. Like it's like boom, boom, yes, that's Kasparov, Karpov, nineteen seventy nine. Right? They know it, but they don't know all the moves of the game. They know what they need to know from that game. And so that's what, keep that in mind as you're studying, as you're watching chess videos, as you're reading chess books, as you're watching these lectures, keep that in mind. Just walk away with something from every game. So let, I'm gonna try to help you do that by summarizing. So in this position, Black made a big mistake right here, which was instead of developing the king's side and getting castled, Black chased after a pawn on d4 while allowing white's pieces to reign free. As a consequence to that, white got their king safe and had all the development and black's king's protection was just simply nowhere to be found. So far stretched to be able to protect the black king here, it takes uh, too long to get castled and white's already generating threats. Rook, to eight, rook h to e1 threatens things along the e-file and so forth. Okay, so again, this is not so important because black is busted in the position. So not really a learning. These are chess tactics. You're not going to remember these a week from now, a month from now, three months from now, three years from now. You're not going to remember these tactics. Uh, this was an important decision. Some suggested takes, takes, and to play this position. Ilyan Zanevsky decided to play knight takes f6 first. Idea being if the pawn takes, we take the queen with check so that loses. Queen takes and queen takes, which still wins a pawn but keeps the queen on the board. So I'm going to give you this piece of advice again and I'm going to attempt not to exhaust you too much by saying the same thing. When you're attacking, do not trade. I don't give a damn if you're up a knight a rook, eight rooks, five rooks, 30 rooks. It's bug house, it's crazy house. I don't care what it is. When you're attacking, you don't trade. You don't trade. I don't care what it is. You don't trade. So I don't care. You're up a pawn, big whoop. You're up a rook, a knight, whatever. So what? What do you, what do you want to trade for? You're the one who's got the attack. The king matters. Black has no king here. White has a king. So you walk away from this game, you're going to walk away with a lot of games. You're going to walk away with a lot of games where when you're on the offensive, there is no reason to trade unless you're dispatching of their protection or something, right? But just like trading your major pieces when you're attacking the king makes no sense. Yeah. So come on. So... 
So yeah, trade when you're up only applies in positions where nothing's happening. But you know, the you have to um, you have to know when to break rules or to and, and remember that you cannot play chess on rules alone. So you have to you have to make up your own rules too. Okay. So welcome, welcome. Okay, innovative panda says I took uh, I took Peter's advice and lost all my shares in the stock market. Yeah, well. Here's the thing, yeah. You gotta be careful when you're rolling the dice, my friend. You gotta be careful when you're rolling the dice. Here, you're not rolling the dice. All the information is in front of you. You see this king, there's no king for black. You're already killing him. There's no reason to trade. You got it right there in front of you. When you're up material, you only trade if you're the one who has to defuse your opponent's initiative. Because quite often, what happens is like, you win some material and as a consequence to winning that material, your opponent liberates themselves a little bit, they get some action, and so the, the logic of trading when you're up material applies more then. When you're up material and you're attacking and you are the one attacking, you don't trade. It doesn't make sense. Hi, I'm Peter Giannatos, founder of the Charlotte Chess Center. Subscribing to our YouTube channel is statistically proven to limit your blunders.